Hello everyone, uh, my name is Amir Hassan. I'll be talking today about AI in stroke and where are we going. Uh, here are my disclosures. So artificial intelligence is an interesting word because it's really computer aided triage. And uh, you know, here's an example of a statement made by, by one of the AI companies in the United States. Artificial intelligence powered computer algorithms designed to assist healthcare professionals in the automatic detection, triage, and management of medical conditions that are often critical and life-threatening. So really what it's trying to do is help us speed things up. And it's really not making decisions, it's not making choices. AI is not really that intelligent, unfortunately. So the recent evolution of artificial intelligence and deep learning um, for some reason, people think this all started in the 1950s. Um, and I'll go through this in a little bit, but it really started, um, you know, 350 BC. And then with, you know, the Greeks and with the uh, Ottoman Empire, the ancient Islamic Empire, and then Austrians uh, with, the, with some of these examples I'm going to discuss. So Aristotle in 350 BC uh, um, speculated that automatons would someday replace human slaves. And the key thing was, each instrument could do its own work at the word or the word of command or by intelligence anticipation. So he really predicted how we would not need subordinates in the future. Um, obviously, he probably included slaves and others, but someday humans could be replaced. And then Ismail al-Jazari in 1136 to 1206 um, this is the height of the Islamic Golden Age, followed his father's footsteps. He's a chief engineer uh, in, in Antolia, I think. Uh, Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices. And written by the bequest of the Sultan. Unfortunately, he never got to see it published. Uh, he passed before it was published. But it contained these mechanical devices. And these devices included moving human and animal, you know, automatic machines. Moving peacocks, a musical robot band of four physicians, uh, they actually had facial expressions, and a waitress that served drinks. So people have been thinking about this for centuries. And then my favorite was the Mechanical Turk, uh, made by Wolfgang von Kempelen in 1770. And it's a chess playing android. And this is where I'm saying, you know, artificial intelligence. Because the machine appeared to play an excellent game of chess, and actually defeated Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin. It's a life-size android sat at a large cabinet and he would actually show people underneath it all of the, you know, levers and everything going on under it. And that it's too small to fit somebody. But actually what was going on is uh, the secret wasn't known for years, but basically the cabinet concealed a human chess expert. And he was using magnets to move the pieces and the various, uh, you know, levers to move the android. So this is what I think artificial intelligence is today. It's really us calling the shots, but it does make things a little bit more efficient. You know, I don't want to take all the credit away from it. It does make things move faster. I'm going to discuss our data and a lot of the things that happened here at Valley Baptist. We were one of the first hub and spokes to really implement uh, AI uh, in a hub and spoke model. Um, you know, obviously there's AI used for, you know, bad things and androids used you know to, to kill people but in the end of the day i don't think we're there uh this is one more historical piece that i thought would, you would find interesting so babbage's mechanical computer 1819 right british mathematician brilliant um after seeing the mechanical turk he thought of more practical uses of a machine or early artificial intelligence so he created a hand cranked mechanical calculator also worked on something but never completed it. One was called the Difference Engine, and one was called the Analytic Engine. And this is just a picture of that that's currently in the London Museum. Uh, and he started the work in 1822 to compete uh, to compute the value of polynomial functions, and it had 25,000 parts. And he said the analytical machine would have over 100,000 parts. And probably the machine itself would be, you know, have to be sized in a building this, uh, almost a kilometer long. So Ada Lovelace, who's considered, you know, the first computer programmer, gave specifications for the analytic machine. Um, and FYI, for those crypto traders of you uh, in the group, uh, the Cardano coin, 
ADA, the symbol, is named after her. Okay, so now let's get back to what people think, you know, when artificial intelligence started. And the idea was you could enable a computer to mimic human intelligence, right? You created rules, decision trees, and there was, you know, very basic machine learning. And that was the robots of the 50s, 60s, 70s. Then in the 80s, what you have is machine learning. So the subset of artificial intelligence, which enabled the machine to identify statistical patterns. And that's your games. So your chess computer game, your Atari, all these things that we played as kids in the 80s and 90s, some of you in the 2000s um, and today, th these were really machine learning. And then deep learning is what we're really talking about today when we talk about artificial intelligence. So it's the subset of machine learning and enables a machine to train itself. So the benefits is that the AI enables a system to learn from the data compared to programming. Because typical machine learning is programming, right? I program something, I know a feature I'm looking for, I classify it, the output is there's an interest variable hemorrhage. That could be developed very easily with advanced programming. Now, using a feature extraction and classification technique and getting an output, that's really deep learning. So an example of a deep neural network is, for example, facial recognition. So you have the input layer of all these faces, then you have the hidden layer, and you start extracting features in the hidden layer. So you're detecting geometric primitives, for example. And then the next hidden layer, you detect more complex features, maybe a mustache, maybe the way a person smiles, the size of their nose, shape of their eyes. Then the third hidden layer detects the general pattern of the face. And then the output is detects the most abstract representation of a face. And that's how facial recognition works today. So the benefits of deep learning is deep learning employs multiple layers of learning. So we believe with, with true machine learning, you could get a little bit better than a human expert, but you really would not continue to improve. And let's be honest, some of us human experts don't continue to improve. So that's where machine learning tops out. And then deep learning allows you to learn from your mistakes. And, it, and the more cases you feed into it, right, the more input layer, um, and it allows itself to extract those hidden layers, the better your outcomes and the better the performance. So these are just some examples of deep learning services, you, you know, Amazon Web Services, Watson, Google Cloud. Deep learning platforms are basically like Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Cognitive Services, and some deep learning frameworks. So a little bit about our program. We do about 1,300 neuro cases a year, 250 mechanical thrombectomies a year. We are now three interventional uh, neurologists. Uh, we have three biplanes at Valley Baptist. We opened a second comprehensive stroke center in McAllen, Texas, part of several trials. Many of you know these trials. Um, and this is what our hub and spoke network looks like. So this is San Antonio here, uh, which is about a four hour drive. Austin's about a five hour drive. Houston's a five hour drive. Corpus Christi is two and a half hours away. So basically everything from Corpus Christi to Laredo down uh, gets transferred to the Valley. It used to all come to Harlingen, uh, Valley Baptist Medical Center, where I'm at today, mostly. Uh, but now with when we open the CSC in McAllen, well, most of our Laredo stuff goes there, just makes more sense. But most of the Corpus Christi stuff still comes to Harlingen. So these are the 12 programs that currently refer to us and how far they are. So uh, as you can see, we have some that are 137 miles away. Uh, 139 miles away, and Harlingen Medical Center is literally down the street, uh, two miles away, yet somehow still takes an hour to transfer a patient. And when you figure it out, let me know. So the current state of mechanical thrombectomy utilization in the U.S. Uh, is pretty poor in the majority of the country. You have places like Denver, you know, Don Fry and company do a great job there, 9.3%. Mechanical thrombectomy utilization in, in, in acute ischemic stroke. Buffalo, right? Adnan, Siddiqui, and, and Elad Levy, the, the, those guys do great things. 8.1%. But now you start going down here. San Antonio, 2.1%. Washington, D.C., 2%. So we really do need to improve the utilization of mechanical thrombectomy. One of the ways we can do that is with artificial intelligence. You're less likely to let patients fall through. 
We all know time is brain, right? Typical elbow patient loses 2 million neurons a minute. And that is great, right? What does 2 million neurons mean? Well, every 20 minute decrease in treatment delay is a three month gain of disability free life. And this is the way I like to explain it to people, why I'm always in a rush. We all know the old trials, right? Mercy and IMS and synthesis and rescue. What was the common theme amongst them all? Poor patient selection, limited use of newer generation devices, but slow times, 124 minutes from imaging to puncture. Just let that settle in a little bit. 124 minutes, two, over two hours to go from CAT scan to puncture the groin. That happens today. Everybody knows I'm going to flip out. Technically, going to flip out. There's no way in hell this would happen. Part of my French. So everything was going so slow. And for those of you who know me, I'm a car nut. So here's a picture of a Yugo for you. Also, we were amateurs, right? There's a picture of all of us when we were at the University of Minnesota training. And we would deploy a stent retriever. We'd leave it open for two minutes, pull out. Oh, let's try three minutes, pull it out. Now we know it's somewhere between five and seven minutes is probably the best approach. And then, of course, now we have a DAP technique with much better aspiration catheters. You go up there, you turn it on, and you can open up vessels in five minutes. So how do we treat more patients faster and better? And obviously, technology is going to be the answer. So this was a nice paper written by Ferdinand Hugh a couple of years ago now about AI to diagnose acute ischemic stroke and identify ELVO. They discussed basically the term platforms that were uh, around, Brainomics, which had the greatest validation of AI for aspects and uses a convolutional neural network to detect large vessel occlusion. Ischemia View, which had the largest number of perfusion study validations for thrombectomy, and Viz AI, which used a convolutional neural network to automatically detect ELVO and then activate an emergency stroke system. Here's an example of a, you know, some of the brainomics images. Here an example of the CTP uh, images from RAPID, the large vessel occlusion detection tool, and of course the automated aspects. Here's an example of the uh, Viz AI tool. Again, uh, large vessel occlusion detection, CTP, and then of course the, their uh, messaging tools. And in the end of the day, the conclusion was that the only one that really used artificial intelligence was Viz. Why? Because it used AI independent thrombectomy activation. Whereas there really wasn't any, this was, this was all machine learning on the left. So rapid and brainomics, that's machine learning. That is basic programming. It's like your video games from the eighties and nineties. Whereas Viz took data and made a decision and triggered the activation of thromb, you know, this is a thrombectomy capable patient. Now, of course, obviously rapid has now something similar. This is just during the publication. Um, so deep neural network for stroke detection. So what's going on? Again, artificial intelligence designed to assist healthcare professionals. And we spent a lot of time trying to reduce setup time and our groin to recan times with this project called Steps T when I first moved here nine years ago. And it was all about standardizing workflow, using you know device and technology education from vendors as well as in-house educators, working on standardization and parallel workflows. So you know, it was, it was published, it really improved a lot of our times, and it's a continuous process. But it's the small amount of time between that and looking at the door to angio suite time, which is two or three times that amount. So early detection, rapid triage, and synchronized care gets the patient faster to your angio suite. So, First, when you're building AI-powered algorithms, I mean, I don't have enough time to go through all this in detail, but the idea is you have these cloud-based convolutional neural networks and you make all these decisions. Now, I'm not gonna go into this detail, I'm just gonna show you the pictures. So the idea is a series identification based on metadata. Head mask extraction, image analysis to detect exclusion criteria, registration, and then the segmentation of the vessels. So this is the money shot here, right? So getting rid of all that noise, getting rid of the skull, possible bleed, you know, whatever is an exclusion criteria, and then looking for that, you know, carotid terminus, M1, M2s. Do the center line growing, as you see in this picture, right, from the blue lines to the red lines, and then you get an alert. And this is what tells you, oh, the line on the, you know, 
your picture here, the line on the right doesn't equal the length of the line on the left, and you probably have a large vessel occlusion. And then, of course, most of us do CT perfusion these days, uh, except Tudor Joven, of course. Uh, but we're part of, you know, several trials, and that's why we do. I actually wrote a paper called Please No CTP. So I am not for CTP. I am just saying that it's part of all the protocols these days. So here are an example of ICA occlusion patient. And, you know, in the segmentation and how the machine was able to pick it up quickly and M2 occlusion. So these systems are getting much better. I can show you images from Rapid and Viz where it really, they do a much better job picking up M2s. And we'll discuss a little bit how I think CTP is actually more useful uh, for distal uh, vessel occlusion and, and, and middle uh, vessel, uh, middle, uh, medium sized vessel occlusions for mechanical thrombectomy in, in the talk tomorrow. So we'll, this is another example of an inferior M2. So I, one of the things I really like about the, the rapid system is it uses this blood vessel density. So, you know, it's, it's nice, it's color coded, right? Red, pretty clear cut. These patients usually have occlusions. Uh, yellow also, occlusions versus uh, potential high grade stenosis. But when you start going out to the, the branches, I think the blood vessel density and the other ranges are gonna be able to help you in combination with CT perfusion to detect distal vessel occlusions. So, What's the key thing here? It's going from serial to parallel workflow, right? These are the certain number of steps that I used to take. I had to have a technologist at Valley Baptist Brownsville, one of our biggest spokes. The technologist has to post-process the CTA images. Then a radiologist reads it. Then he calls the ED physician, who calls the neurologist, who calls the interventionalist, who then calls me. I mean, come on, it's way too many steps. And then I'm calling the house supervisor. So um, basically standardizing that stroke workflow, making things go fast, the old workflow over two hours, and then really being able to speed things up, we're able to make this uh, work much faster. I didn't want to waste time showing you this video. Uh, so I'm gonna just talk about the solutions. So we all know these different things that we have done throughout the years to improve door to needle, like target stroke program. The reduction to specialist notification with Viz has decreased by 52 minutes. Now, machine learning is getting better. Let's be honest. I was one of the first sites to have Viz installed. Sensitivity and specificity was not what it is today. It is much, much better today. And this paper was published, uh, let's see here, 2020. 96% sensitivity in ruling out disease, of course. 94% specificity in ruling in. So our early experience utilizing artificial intelligence showed significant reduction in transfer times. We specifically looked at Valley Baptist Brownsville, Valley Baptist Harlingen, and those patients transferred between the two. And it, what kind of outcome change was, was there? So there was a significant change in the length of stay in these patients. So this was also published in Interventional Neuroradiology. And as you can tell, I really like this journal. And one of my friends who is part of this meeting committee is going to be the feature editor, so congrats. So we wanted to look at, is this tool really going to help us transfer large vessel occlusion patients and get them to cath lab faster than what we used to do? And basically our neuro hospitals there were on top of the ED docs and ED docs were awesome and everybody's trying to stay on top of things. But again, that post-processing is what killed us. So we took, um, it's a multi-center study in the sense that it was us in Valley Baptist Brownsville. We only looked at those patients specifically from Valley Baptist Brownsville transferred in. And this is what we found. So November, 2018 is when it started. And we looked at the date until May, 2019 uh, because we needed to analyze the data and submit it to ISC. Uh, and then we used the historical workflow was from February, 2017 to November, 2018. And as you can see here, the average was 171 minutes prior. And you can see all the number of boxes there, all the number of steps. And now it dropped to 105 minutes. I can't fix EMS. I can't fix transfer time. It takes an hour to transfer from two minutes, you know, two miles down the road. It still takes them an hour to transfer. So there's some things we can't affect, but we could affect everything going on in the hospital. Triggering that transfer, everybody on the same tool, everybody messaging, right? When that alert goes on, if I'm in a case, the neuro hospital is messaging. Over there at Brownsville, if not, the ER doc is. Everybody's communicating, things get done much faster, and we saved 66 minutes. And that led directly to a 55% neuro ICU length of stay reduction. 
So 39% reduction in time, 171 to 105 minutes. We had 55% reduction in our ICU length of stay. And obviously we know time is money, not just brain, right? These things cost things. And before the NTAP approval, um, you know, we needed to justify to our CFO and the CFO at the other hospital why they would invest in this. And they need to see that time saved really is cost savings. But when it comes down to patient outcomes, I'm going to be honest, I don't think CFOs really care, right? His job is to make the hospital profitable. The outcomes is somebody else's job. So then we bring him this slide and we say the length of stay is also money. Because if your average mechanical thrombectomy is X amount DRG, you're getting the same amount of money, whether the patient stayed two days, patient stayed seven days. But if I can show you that we saved about two and a half days on average total length of stay, and specifically in the ICU, we saved three and a half days, you're saving over $12,000 a patient. So obviously the continued clinical evidence, uh, it, it continues to grow, right? We showed saving time. Uh, Joanna Fifi and Jay Mako showed significant improved outcomes after they initiated VIZ in their hub and spoke model. We also showed here data from uh, Don Fry's program in Colorado, how they showed a 16% increase in patients that qualified for thrombectomy. They, were, they did 44 more mechanical thrombectomies uh, post VIZ. And one of the interesting things about Don's data is all their patients were done within 90 minutes after implementing VIZ. So it was, it was actually very impressive. So these were presented at ISC last year, and we showed then the following year's data, how we significantly reduced door in door out times, right? So at the primary stroke center, workups being done, patient is being transferred, and then you're transferring that patient. It's 23 miles between me and Valley Baptist Brownsville. We saved 120, 102 minutes, 45% reduction in door in door out time. And that led to an 11% improvement in good modified ranking at discharge. And we know that this is going to be better in 90 days. But unfortunately, we have a very tough time considering we're a hub and spoke model, like uh, all of you probably are. Getting these patients to follow up with us is almost impossible. So uh, that's why we always use our discharge data. So the other uh, takeaway is the uh, AI improved door into puncture time at Mothership. So at Valley Baptist Neuroscience Institute, we saw after implementing VIZ, there was significant improvement in time. 86.9 minutes saved from door in to groin puncture time. And then, of course, there was, there was a bad run of cases. Um, I'm not going to say which studies we were a part of at the time. But, yeah, there were a lot of patients that were not getting a modified TICI 2B3. And then it did improve afterwards. And here's just a real-world example. Dr. Techley gets called for a case, right, and alerts, right, very obvious large vessel occlusion, CTP images, beautiful penumbra, you know, pre and post angio, growing to recanalization under eight minutes. I believe this patient was door to device time was less than 60 minutes. I mean, it really is a useful tool. So again, decreased length of stay. Uh, I think the future of AI is going to be in uh, electronic health record integration, being able, uh, you know, we work very closely with Viz. Full disclosure, uh, we do research with them. You're going to be able to input that data. So whether if you're the hospitalist at the referring center, you can put in the NIH, you can put the baseline modified rank in, last known well. If the patient comes and we find out the last known well is wrong, we can change it. And then all this data is going to be dumped into the electronic medical record. So very, very useful. And then, of course, every time someone modifies it, they push that alert to your Apple Watch and you get the alert. Also, a big thing I think that's coming up in in um, artificial intelligence is ICH detection. We've had this tool now for several months. Uh, we are using it now as part of the emboli study for subdurals as well. So identification, volume sizes, it's very, very useful and just much, much faster alertness. We're an Artemis site. We're gonna be part of the MIND trial. Uh, we do that minimally invasive hematoma evacuation. So it is very, very useful to get these. Uh, alerts, screen the patients immediately, and then, you know, if the patient's a good candidate, you treat the patient. So in conclusion, the implementation of AI uh, in an optimized hub and spoke network, right? We believe we're optimized, significantly improves patient treatment times and decreased length of stay in an ICU as well as total length of stay. The implementation of AI in an optimized CSE continues to improve door to groin puncture times. 
This data furthers the idea that AI software, along with an improved workflow, is a very effective tool and will allow for improved patient outcomes. So some food for thought. Is the future just newer devices? You know, uh, this was a device that Phenox was trying to use for strokes. Obviously, uh, it was never approved. Uh, maybe robotics is the future, right? Um, you know, Dr. Craig's Dr. Brzezicki can do cases from their bedroom um, and, you know, uh, in Timbuktu, Alaska, and never have to, you know, leave, leave the office. Maybe they're going to replace us with robots. Um, I don't think robots are a good idea. Uh, I have watched way too many movies. And of course, uh, AI in general also might not be a good idea. And for those of you who don't know what this is, this is HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey 2001. And they, when they wrote that movie in the 60s, they thought by 2001, we would have a system that would basically do everything for us. And obviously, as you can tell today, we are far from that. Thank you very much. And I hope you join us at the SVIN meeting in November in Phoenix.